Hello everyone and good morning. It's the morning here in the UK and I've got a bit of time so I thought let me jump on and read another chapter of a short history of nearly everything by Bill Bryson and as this is one of uh, the random stream I've just decided this morning to go live I imagine most of you will be watching on catch up so I hope you're all doing well and enjoying the continuation of Bill Bryson. Next week when we begin the return of the king, Lord of the Rings. I'm probably going to have to do one of these in the afternoon if I have time in order not to eat into the Lord of the Rings reading. So I'm going to be pretty busy over the next few weeks, I think. But that's great. More to read. And this chapter, I believe, is about fossils and paleontology. If Because the, the previous chapter that we read, The Stonebreakers Ended, the problem was that nearly all the fossil evidence contradicted this and suddenly in the 19th century there was a lot of fossil evidence and so we can infer and assume that science read in tooth and claw, which is what we'll be reading, it's a little bit vague, that title, not very catchy, I mean I don't even know, to look at that I'll say well, what's this chapter about, but anyway... We're here, it's the next chapter to read, and if you're enjoying this wonderful journey through science and natural history, like the video, subscribe if you're not yet, and consider sharing the show with other uh, thinkers and people that like to um, consider these things, or even who are interested in learning, which is what we're doing here, we're learning all about natural history, and um, yeah, the, the great leaps in science. And so that's enough of that. Let's get right into it. Chapter 6. Science read in tooth and claw. In 1787, someone in New Jersey, exactly who now seems to be forgotten, found an enormous thigh bone sticking out of a stream bank at a place called Woodbury Creek. The bone clearly didn't belong to any species of creature still alive, certainly not in New Jersey. From what little is known now, it is thought to have belonged to a hadrosaur, a large duck-billed dinosaur. At the time, dinosaurs were unknown. You hear that? In 1787, no one knew about dinosaurs. Crazy. We think again, this, this notion, everyone alive has always known about dinosaurs. But according to Bryson here, in 1787... Dinosaurs were unknown. The bone was sent to Dr. Caspar Wister, the nation's leading anatomist, who described it as a meeting of the American, or sorry, who described it at a meeting of the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia that autumn. Unfortunately, Wistar failed completely to recognise the bone's significance and merely made a few cautious and uninspired remarks to the effect that it was indeed a whopper. <laughs> he thus missed the chance, half a century ahead of anyone else, to be the discoverer of dinosaurs. Indeed, the bone excited so little interest that it was put in a storeroom and eventually disappeared altogether. So the first dinosaur bone ever found was also the first one to be lost. That bone didn't attract greater interest Oh, sorry, that the bone didn't attract greater interest is more than a little puzzling, for its appearance came at a time when America was in a froth of excitement about the remains of large ancient animals. The cause of this froth was a strange assertion by the great French naturalist Comte de Buffon, he of the heated spheres from the previous chapter, that living things in the new world were inferior in nearly every way to those of the old world. America, Buffon wrote in his vast and much esteemed Historie Naturelle, <laughs> excuse me, was a land where the water was stagnant, the soil unproductive, and the animals without size or vigour, their constitutions weakened by the noxious vapour that rose from its rotting swamps and sunless forests. In such an environment, even the native Indians lacked virility. They have no beard or body hair. Buffon sagely confided, and no ardour for the female. Their reproductive organs were small and feeble. Hello there, King Arjun. It's been a while. 
haven't seen you for a while. How are you? Just the two of us, it seems. So welcome. Uh, how are you? I hope you're well. Buffon's observations found surprisingly eager support among other writers, especially those whose conclusions were not complicated by actual familiarity with the country. A Dutchman named Corneel de Poor announced in a popular work called Recherches, <laughs> Researches Philosophiques sur les Américains that Native American males were not only reproductively unimposing, but so lacking in virility that they had milk in their breasts. <laughs> Such views enjoyed an improbable durability and could be found repeated or echoed in European texts until the near until near the end of the 19th century. Not surprisingly, such aspersions were indignantly met in America. Thomas Jefferson incorporated a furious, and unless the context is understood, quite bewildering rebuttal in his Notes on the State of Virginia, and included his New Hampshire friend, General John Sullivan, or, and induced his New Hampshire friend, General John Sullivan, to send 20 soldiers into the northern woods to find a bull moose to present to Buffon as proof of the stature and majesty of American quadrupeds. It took the men two weeks to track down a suitable subject. The moose, when shot, unfortunately lacked the, unim the imposing horns that Jefferson had spe specified, but Sullivan thoughtfully included a rack of antlers from an elk or stag with the suggestion that these be attached instead. Who in France, after all, would know? Meanwhile, in Philadelphia, Wistar City, naturalists had begun to assemble the bones of a giant elephant-like creature known at first as the Great American Incognitum, but later identified, not quite correctly, as a mammoth. The first of these bones had been discovered at a place called Big Bone Lick in Kentucky, but soon others were turning up all over. America, it appeared, had once been the home of a truly substantial creature, one that would surely disprove Buffon's foolish Gallic contentions. In their keenness to demonstrate the incognitum's bulk and ferocity, the American naturalists appear to have become slightly carried away. They overestimated its size by a factor of six and gave it frightening claws, which, in fact, came from a megal megalonynx or giant ground sloth, found nearby. Rather remarkably, they persuaded themselves that the animal had enjoyed the agility and ferocity of the tiger, and portrayed it in illustrations as pouncing with feline grace onto prey from boulders. When tusks in any number or when tusks were discovered, they were forced into the animal's head by any number of invented ways. One restorer screwed the tusks in upside down like the fangs of a saber-toothed cat, which gave it a satisfyingly aggressive aspect. Another arranged the tusks so that they curved backwards, on the engaging theory that the creature had been aquatic and had used them to anchor itself to trees while dozing. <laughs> the most pertinent consideration about the incognitum, however, was that it appeared to be extinct, a fact that Buffon cheerfully seized upon as proof of its contestable degenerate nature. Buffon died in 1788, but the controversy rolled on. In 1795, a selection of bones made their way to Paris, where they were examined by the rising star of paleontology, the youthful and aristocratic Georges Cuvier. Cuvier was already dazzling people with his genius for taking heaps of disarticulated bones and whipping them into shapely forms. It was said that he could describe the look and nature of an animal from a single tooth or scrap of jaw, and often named the species and genus into the bargain. Realising that no one in America had thought to write a formal description of the lumbering beast, Cuvier did so, and thus became its official discoverer. He called it a mastodon, which means a tooth unexpectedly, which means a touch unexpectedly, nipple teeth. <laughs> Inspired by the controversy, in 1796, Cuvier wrote a landmark paper, Note on the Species of Living and Fossil Elephants, in which he put forward for the first time a formal theory of extinctions. His belief was that, from time to time, the Earth experienced global catastrophes in which groups of creatures were wiped out. In 
For religious people, including Cuvier himself, the idea raised uncomfortable implications since it suggested an unaccountable casualness on the part of providence. To what end would God create species only to wipe them out later? The notion was contrary to the belief in the great chain of being, which held that the world was carefully ordered, and that every living thing within it had a place and purpose, and always had, and always would. Jefferson, for one, couldn't abide the thought that the whole species would never be permitted, that whole species would ever be permitted to vanish, or come to that, to evolve. So when it was put to him that there might be scientific and political value in sending a party to explore the interior of America beyond the Mississippi, he leaped at the idea, hoping the intrepid adventurers would find herds of healthy mastodons and other outsized creatures grazing on the bounteous plains. Jefferson's personal secretary and trusted friend Meriwether Lewis was chosen co-leader with William Clark and chief naturalist for the expedition. The person selected to advise him on what to look out for with regard to animals living and deceased was none other than Caspar Wistar. In the same year, in fact, the same month that the aristocratic and celebrated Cuvier was propounding his extinction theories in Paris, on the other side of the English Channel, a rather more obscure Englishman was having an insight into the value of fossils that would also have lasting ramifications. William Smith was a young supervisor of construction on the Somerset Coal Canal. On the evening of the 5th of January, 1796, he was sitting in a coaching inn in Somerset when he jotted down the notion that would eventually make his reputation. To interpret rocks, there needs to be some means of correlation, a basis on which you can tell that those carboniferous, that those car, a basis on which that you can tell that those carboniferous rocks from Devon are younger than these Cambrian rocks from Wales. Smith's insight was to realise that the answer lay with fossils. At every change in rock strata, certain species of fossils disappeared, while others carried on into subsequent levels. By noting which species appeared in which strata, you could work out the relative age of rocks wherever they appeared. Drawing on his knowledge as a surveyor, Smith began at once to make a map of Britain's rock strata, which would be published after many trials in 1815 and would become a cornerstone of modern geology. The story is comprehensively covered in Simon Winchester's popular book, The Map That Changed the World. Unfortunately, having had his insight, Smith was curiously uninterested in understanding why rocks were laid down in the way that they were. I have left off puzzling about the origin of strata and content myself with knowing that it is so, he recorded. The whys and wherefores cannot come within the province of a mineral surveyor. Smith's revelation regarding strata heightened the moral awkwardness concerning extinctions. To begin with, it confirmed that God had wiped out creatures, not occasionally, but repeatedly. This made him seem not so much careless as peculiarly hostile. It also made it conveniently necessary to explain how some species were wiped out while others continued unimpeded into succeeding aeons. Clearly there was more to extinctions than could be accounted for by a single Noachian deluge, as the biblical flood was known, or Noachian maybe, Noachian. Cuvier resolved the matter to his own satisfaction by suggesting that Genesis applied only to the most recent inundation, God, it appeared, hadn't wished to distract or alarm Moses with news of earlier irrelevant extinctions. So, by the early years of the 19th century, fossils had taken on a certain inescapable importance, which makes Wistar's failure to see the significance of his dinosaur bone all the more unfortunate. Suddenly, in any case, bones were turning up all over. Several other opportunities arose for Americans to claim the discovery of dinosaurs, but all were wasted. In 1806, the Lewis and Clark expedition passed through the Hell Creek Formation in Montana, an area where fossil hunters would later literally trip over dinosaur bones, and even examined what was clearly a dinosaur bone embedded in rock, but failed to make anything of it. Other bones and fossilized footprints were found in the Connecticut River Valley of New England after a farm boy named 
Plinus Moody spied ancient tracks on a rock ledge at South Hadley, Massachusetts. Some of these at least survive, notably the bones of an Ankisaurus, which are in the collection of the Peabody Museum at Yale. Found in 1818, they were the first dinosaur bones to be examined and saved, but unfortunately weren't recognised for what they were until 1855. In that same year, 1818, Caspar Wispar died, but he did gain a certain unexpected immortality when a botanist named Thomas Nuttall named a delightful climbing shrub after him. Some botanical purists still insist on spelling it Wistaria, which I believe would be the Wisteria plant, right? So interesting. <clears throat> By this time, however, paleontological momentum had moved to England. In 1812, at Lyme Regis on the Dorset coast, an extraordinary child named Mary Anning, aged 11, 12 or 13, depending on whose account you read, found a strange fossilised sea monster, 17 feet long and now known as the Ichthyosaurus, embedded in a in the steep and dangerous cliffs along the English Channel. It was the start of a remarkable career. Anning would spend the next 35 years gathering fossils which she sold to visitors. She is commonly held to be the source for the famous tongue twister, She Sells Seashells on the Seashore. She would also find the first Plesiosaurus, another marine monster, and one of the first and best pterodactyls. Though none of these was technically a dinosaur, that wasn't terribly relevant at the time since nobody then knew what a dinosaur was. It was enough to realise that the world had once held creatures strikingly unlike anything we might now find. It wasn't simply that Anning was good at spotting fossils, though she was unrivalled at that, but that she could extract them with the greatest delicacy and without damage. If you ever have the chance to visit the Hall of Ancient Marine Reptiles at the Natural History Museum in London, I urge you to take it, for there is no other way to appreciate the scale and beauty of what this young woman achieved working virtually unaided with the most basic tools in nearly impossible conditions. The, ply the pliosaur alone took her ten years of patient ex excavation, Although untrained, Anning was able to provide competent drawings and descriptions for scholars. But even with the advantage of her skills, significant finds were rare, and she passed most of her life in considerable poverty. It would be hard to think of a more overlooked person in the history of paleontology than Mary Anning, but in fact there was one who came painfully close. His name was Gideon Algernon Mantle, and he was a country doctor in Sussex. Mantle was a lanky assemblage of shortcomings. He was vain, self-absorbed, priggish, neglectful of his family, but never was there a more committed amateur paleontologist. He was also lucky to have devoted to have a, an he was also lucky to have a devoted and observant wife. In 1822, while he was making a house call on a patient in rural Sussex, Mrs. Mantle went for a stroll down a nearby lane, and in a pile of rubble that had been left to fill potholes, she found a curious object, a curved brown stone about the size of a small walnut. Knowing her husband's interest in fossils and thinking it might be one, she took it to him. Mantle, Mantle could see at once that it was a fossilised tooth, and after a little study became certain that it was from an animal that was herbivorous, reptilian, extremely large, tens of feet long, and from the Cretaceous period. He was right on all counts, but these were bold conclusions, since nothing like it had been seen before or even imagined. Aware that his finding would entirely upend what was understood about the past and urged by his friend, the Reverend William Buckland, he of the gowns and ex an experimental appetite to proceed with caution, Mantle devoted three painstaking years to seeking evidence to support his conclusions. He sent the tooth to Cuvier in Paris for an opinion, but the great Frenchman dismissed it as being from a hippopotamus. Cuvier later apologised handsomely for this uncharacteristic error. One day, while doing research at the Hunterian Museum in London, Mantle fell into conversation with a fellow researcher who told him the tooth looked very like those of animals he had been studying, South American iguanas, 
a hasty comparison confirmed the resemblance, and so Mantle's creature became the Iguanodon, after a basking tropical lizard to which it was not in any manner related. <clears throat> Mantle prepared a paper for delivery to the Royal Society. Unfortunately, it emerged that another dinosaur had been found at a quarry in Oxfordshire and had just been formally described by the Reverend Buckland, the very man who had urged him not to work in haste. It was the Megalosaurus, and the name was actually suggested to Buckland by his friend Dr. James Parkinson, the would-be radical and epinum for Parkinson's disease. Buckland, it may be recalled, was foremost a geologist, and he showed it with his work on Megalosaurus. In his report for the Transactions of the Geological Society of London, he noted that the creature's teeth were not attached directly to the jawbone as in lizards, but placed in sockets in the manner of crocodiles. But having noticed this much, Buckland failed to realise what it meant, namely that Megalosaurus was an entirely new type of creature. Still, although his report demonstrated little acuity or insight, it was the first published description of a dinosaur, and so it is to Buckland, rather than the far more deserving mantle, that the credit goes for the discovery of this ancient line of beings. Unaware that disappointment was going to be a continuing feature of his life, Mantle continued hunting for fossils. He found another giant, the Hyliosaurus, in 1833, and purchasing others from quarrymen and farmers until he had probably the largest fossil collection in Britain. Mantle was an excellent doctor and equally gifted bone hunter, but he was unable to support both his talents. As his collecting mania grew, he neglected his medical practice, Soon fossils filled nearly the whole of his house in Brighton and consumed much of his income. A good deal of the rest went to underwriting the publication of books that few cared to own. Illustrations of the Geology of Sussex, published in 1827, sold only 50 copies and left him £300 out of pocket, an uncomfortably substantial sum for the times. In some desperation, Mantle hit on the idea of turning his house into a museum and charging admission, then belatedly realised that such a mercenary act would ruin his standing as a gentleman, not to mention as a scientist, so he allowed people to visit the house for free. They came in their hundreds, week after week, disrupting both his practice and his home life. Eventually he was forced to sell most of his collection to pay off his debts. Soon after his wife left him, taking their four children with her. Remarkably, his troubles were only just beginning. <laughs> Poor chap. <clears throat> in the district of Sydenham in South London, at a place called Crystal Palace Park, there stands a strange and forgotten site, the world's first life-sized models of dinosaurs. Not many people travel there these days, but once this was one of the most popular attractions in London. In effect, as Richard Forty has noted, the world's first theme park. Quite a lot about the models is not strictly correct. The iguanodon's thumb has been placed on its nose as a kind of spike, and it stands on four sturdy legs, making it look like a rather stout and awkwardly overgrown dog. In life, the iguanodon did not crouch on all fours, but was bipedal. Looking at them now, you would scarcely guess that these odd and lumbering beasts could cause great rancour and bitterness, but they did. Perhaps nothing in natural history has been at the centre of fiercer and more enduring hatreds than the line of ancient beasts known as dinosaurs. At the time of the dinosaurs' construction, Sydenham was on the edge of London, and its spacious park was considered an ideal place to re-erect the famous Crystal Palace, the glass and cast iron structure that had been the centrepiece of the Great Exhibition of 1851, and from which the new park naturally took its name. The dinosaurs, built of concrete, were a kind of bonus attraction, on New Year's Eve, 1853, a famous dinner for 21 prominent scientists was this time he had already devoted several productive years to making Gideon Mantle's life hell. Owen had grown up in Lancaster, in the north of England, where he had trained as a doctor. He was a born anatomist and so devoted to his studies that he sometimes illicitly borrowed limbs, organs and other parts from corpses and took them home for leisurely dissection. <laughs> 
Once, while carrying a sack containing the head of a black African sailor that he had just removed, Owen slipped on a wet cobble and watched in horror as the head bounced away from him down the lane and through the open doorway of a cottage where it came to rest in the front parlour. What the occupants had to say upon finding an unattached head rolling to a halt at their feet can only be imagined. One assumes that they had not formed any terribly advanced conclusions when, an instant later, a, a fraught-looking young man rushed in, wordlessly retrieved the head, and rushed out again. <laughs> In 1825, aged just 21, Owen moved to London and soon after was engaged by the Royal College of Surgeons to help organise their extensive but disordered collections of medical and anatomical specimens. Most of these had been left to the institution by John Hunter, a distinguished surgeon and tireless collector of medical curiosities, but had never been catalogued or organised largely because the paperwork explaining the significance of each had gone missing soon after Hunter's death. Owen swiftly distinguished himself with his powers of organisation and deduction. At the same time, he showed himself to be a peerless anatomist with instincts for reconstruction almost on par with the great Cuvier in Paris. He became such an expert on the anatomy of animals that he was granted first refusal on any animal that died at the London Zoological Gardens, and these he would invariably have delivered to his house for examination. Once his wife returned home to find a freshly deceased rhinoceros filling the front hallway. He quickly became a leading expert on all kinds of animals living and extinct from platypuses, ec echidnas, echidnas and other newly discovered marsupials to the hapless dodo and the extinct giant birds called moas that had roamed New Zealand until eaten out of existence by the Maoris. He was the first to describe the Archeo Archaeopteryx after its discovery in Bavaria in 1861 and the first to write a formal epitaph for the dodo. Altogether, he produced some 600 anat an anatomical papers, a prodigious output. But it was for his work with dinosaurs that Owen is remembered. He coined the term dinosauria in 1841. It means terrible lizard and was a curiously inapt name. Dinosaurs, as we now know, weren't all terrible. Some were no bigger than rabbits and probably extremely retiring. And the one thing they most emphatically were not was lizards, which were actually of a much older, by 30 million years, lineage. Owen was well aware that the creatures were reptilian and had at his disposal a perfectly good Greek, Greek word, herpeton, but for some reason chose not to use it. Another, more excusable error, given the paucity of specimens at the time, was his failure to note that dinosaurs constitute not one, but two orders of reptiles, the bird-hipped ornith... Goodness me. Give me a second with these terms. The bird-hipped ornithischians and the lizard-hipped saurischians. Try that again. Another more excusable error, given the paucity of specimens at the time, was his failure to note that dinosaurs constitute not one, but two orders of reptiles, the bird-hipped ornithischians and the lizard-hipped saurischians. Owen was not an attractive person in appearance or in temperament. A photograph from his late middle years shows him as gaunt and sinister, like the villain in a Victorian melodrama with long, lank hair and bulging eyes a face to frighten babies. In manner he was cold and imperious, and he was without scruple in the furtherance of his ambitions. He was the only person Charles, Charles Darwin was ever known to hate. Even Owen's son, who soon after killed himself, referred to his father's lamentable coldness of heart. His undoubted gifts as an anatomist allowed him to get away with the most barefaced dishonesties. In 1857, the naturalist T. H. Huxley was leafing through a new edition of Churchill's Medical Directory when he noticed that Owen was listed as Professor of Comparative Anatomy and Physiological and Physiology at the Government School of Mines, which rather surprised Huxley, as that was the position he held. Upon inquiring how Churchill's 
a fellow natu naturalist named Hugh Faulkner, meanwhile, caught Owen taking credit for one of his discoveries. Others accused him of borrowing specimens, then denying he had done so. Owen even fell into a bitter dispute with the Queen's dentist over the credit for a theory concerning the physiology of teeth. He did not hesitate to persecute those whom he disliked. Early in his career, Owen used his influence at the Zoological Society to blackball a young, name, a young man named Robert Grant, whose only crime was to have shown promise as a fellow anatomist. Grant was astonished to discover that he was suddenly denied access to the anatomical specimens he needed to conduct his research. Unable to pursue his work, he sank into an understandably dispirited obscurity. But no one suffered more from Owen's unkindly attentions than the hapless and increasingly tragic Gideon Mantle. After losing his wife, his children, his medical practice and most of all his fossil collection, Mantle moved to London. There, in 1841, the fateful year in which Owen would achieve his greatest glory for naming and identifying the dinosaurs, Mantle was involved in a terrible accident. While crossing Clapham Common in a carriage, he somehow fell from his seat, grew entangled in the reins and was dragged at a gallop over rough ground by the panicked horses. The accident left him bent, crippled and in chronic pain, with the spine damaged beyond repair. Capitalising on Mantle's enfeebled state, Owen set about systematically expunging his contributions from the record, renaming species that Mantle had named years before and claiming credit for their discovery for himself. Mantle continued to try to do original research, but Owen used his influence at the Royal Society to ensure that most of his papers were rejected. In 1852, unable to bear any more pain or persecution, Mantle took his own life. His deformed spine was removed and sent to the Royal College of Surgeons where, now here's an irony for you, it was placed in the care of Richard Owen, director of the college's Hunterian Museum. And there's another example of personalities throughout history, right? These two chaps, Owen and Mantle. And because Owen, I'm sure it's Owen, isn't it? Let me just double check. Because... Um, yeah, because Owen was in a position of power, he could make Mantle's life hell and, I mean, expunge him from the record and change his name out, you know. Mantle had found some dinosaur and let, let's change Mantle to Owen and I'll take the credit for that, thank you. And, um, of course, if it goes on in science, then it must go on everywhere in the world, right? It's just that maybe we don't know about it and historically... Unless you're reading something like this, and again, we we take uh, we take everything Bryson saying here with a um, with some what's the word? Uh, with with we be generous to him, you know. If you're reading a book and every page you want to go and Google search and fact check, that's not much fun reading a book. So we give him the benefit of the doubt and accept all this as as gospel. But yeah, it just shows that. The good guys don't always win, huh? <laughs> but the insults had not quite finished. Oh, dearie, dearie. Soon after Mantle's death, an arrestingly uncharitable obituary appeared in the Literary Gazette. In it, Mantle was characterised as a mediocre anatomist whose modest contributions to paleontology were limited by a want of exact knowledge. The obituary even removed the discovery of the Iguanodon from him and credited it instead to Cuvier and Owen, among others. Though the piece carried no byline, the style was Owen's and no one in the world of the natural sciences doubted the authorship. By this stage, however, Owen's transgressions were beginning to catch up with him. His und oh, here we go, bit of karma coming for Owen, hopefully. His undoing began when a committee of the Royal Society, a committee of which he happened to be chairman, decided to award him its highest honour, the Royal Medal, for a paper he had written on an extinct mollusk called the Bellum Knight. However, as Deborah Cabri notes in her excellent History of the Period, Terrible Lizard, this piece of work was not quite as original as it appeared. The Bellum Knight, it turned out, had been discovered four years earlier by an amateur naturalist named Channing Pierce, and the discovery had been fully reported at a meeting of the Geological Society. 
Owen had been at that meeting, but failed to mention this when he presented a report of his own to the Royal Society, at which, not incidentally, he rechristened the creature Bellum Knights Oweni in his own honour. Although Owen was allowed to keep the Royal Medal, the episode left a permanent tarnish on his reputation even among his few remaining supporters. Eventually, Huxley managed to do to Owen what Owen had done to so many others. He had him voted off the councils of the zoological and royal societies. To round off the retribution, Huxley became the new Hunterian professor at the Royal College of Surgeons. Bit of karma. Owen would never again do important research, but the latter half of his career was devoted to one unexceptionable pursuit for which we can all be grateful. In 1856, he became head of the Natural History section of the British Museum, in which capacity he became the driving force behind the creation of London's Natural History Museum. The grand and beloved Gothic heap in South Kensington, opened in 1880, is almost entirely a testament to his vision. Now I'm torn. Now I'm torn how to feel about this Owen, and this is why, just like everything is there's more to it than it would seem. There's also a lot of nuance that we might not be aware of unless we read something like this. So now I'm torn. He was a horrible man who, you know, put Mantle into destitution and eventually into the grave and did the same thing to lots of other people. But then he created the Natural History Museum. <laughs> which I've been to dozens of times as a small child and with my own children, and I love it, you know, when you go in and there's, I think, the Diplodocus in the foyer, incredible uh, sort of the the uh, the impression that that Diplodocus gives, or maybe it's a Brontosaurus, one of those two. I'm sure it's a Diplodocus. And like it says there, that was, it's an entirely a testament to Owen's vision. I suppose it shows you can love and hate someone uh, at the same time, although they're probably a bit strong words. <clears throat> Before Owen, museums were designed primarily for the use and edification of the elite, and even they found it difficult to gain access. In the early days of the British Museum, prospective visitors had to make a written application and undergo a brief interview to determine if they were fit to be admitted at all. They then had to return a second time to pick up a ticket, that is, assuming they had passed the interview, and finally come back a third time to view the museum's treasures. Even then, they were whisked through in groups and not allowed to linger. Owen's plan was to welcome everyone, even to the point of encouraging working men to visit in the evening and to devote most of the museum space to public displays. He even proposed, very radically, to put informative labels on each display so that people could appreciate what they were viewing. In this, somewhat unexpectedly, he was opposed by T. H. Huxley, who believed that museums should be primary, primarily research institutes. By making the Natural History Museum an institution for everyone, Owen transformed our expectations of what museums are for. I agree there, Ross. I agree. It's, it's well up there anyway. Yeah, definitely the best for me, but then I haven't been to the mall, so maybe there's better ones out there. Still, his altruism towards his fellow man generally did not deflect him from more personal rivalries. One of his last official acts was to lobby against the proposal to erect a statue in memory of Charles Darwin. In this he failed, though he did achieve a certain belated inadvertent triumph. Today his own statue commands a masterful view from the staircase of the main hall in the Natural History Museum, while Darwin and T. H. Huxley are consigned somewhat obscurely to the museum coffee shop, where they stare gravely over people snacking on cups of tea and jam donuts. So, uh, they are talking about Owen, aren't they? Um, yeah, Owen... They're saying where I can I can sort of see the statue. What they're saying where Owen sits, um, the staircase in the main hall. So like I was just describing, you got the uh, the Diplodocus slash Brontosaurus, and then there's stairs that go up and then it like forks off. It goes off, and there's a statue there. So I would have seen this statue again every time I went there, 
I would have walked past the statue or at least looked over at it. And this is this gent, Owen. I can't even remember his first name, not that it matters. Does it matter, his first name? Owen, we'll stick to Owen, because I'm not going to find it where it says his first name. And, and this is, again, just to digress quickly, learning, understanding and knowledge. Now, if I were ever to go with my children and I looked over at this statue of Owen, a lot more information would come in regarding it than when I was a boy or all the other times I've been and I just look over and there's a fellow over there, there's a gentleman. Maybe if I read the plaque, it might say something different. It probably wouldn't go into all this detail about his previous rivalries, but that's why books are great, right? Because they, they teach you, you learn, and you, you know more about the world. It would be reasonable to suppose... Oh, here we go. I didn't have to look far. It's right there. Richard Owen. <laughs> Looking back when it's right there in front of my nose. It would be reasonable to suppose that Richard Owen's petty rivalries marked the low point of 19th century paleontology. But in fact, worse was to come. This time from overseas. Oh my. In America, in the closing decades of the century, there arose a rivalry between even more spectacular a rivalry even more spectacularly venomous, if not quite as destructive. It was between two strange and ruthless men, Edward Drinker Cope and Othniel Charles Marsh. What a strange pair of names. They had much in common. Both were spoiled, driven, self-centred, quarrelsome, jealous, mistrustful and ever unhappy. Between them they changed the world of paleontology. They began as friends and admirers, even naming fossil species after each other, and spent a pleasant week together in 1868. However, something then went wrong between them. Nobody is quite sure what, and by the following year they had developed an enmity that would grow into consuming hatred over the next three decades. It is probably safe to say that no two people in the natural sciences have ever despised each other more. Marsh, the elder of the two by eight years, was a retiring and bookish fellow with a trim beard and dapper manner who spent little time in the field and was seldom very good at finding things when he was there. On a visit to the famous dinosaur fields of Como Bluff, Wyoming, he failed to notice the bones that were, in the words of one historian, lying everywhere like logs. <laughs> but he had the means to buy almost anything he wanted. Although he came from a modest background, his father was a farmer in upstate New York, his uncle was the supremely rich and extraordinarily indulgent financier George Peabody. When Marsh showed an interest in natural history, Peabody had a museum built for him at Yale and provided funds sufficient for him to fill it with almost whatever took his fancy. Cope was born more directly into privilege. His father was a rich Philadelphia businessman and was by far the more adventurous of the two. In the summer of 1876 in Montana, while George Armstrong Custer and his troops were being cut down at Little Bighorn, Cope was out hunting for bones nearby. When it was pointed out to him that this was probably not the most prudent time to be taking treasures from Indian lands, Cope thought for a minute and decided to press on anyway. He was having too good a season. At one point he ran into a, into a party of suspicious Crow Indians, but he managed to win them over by repeatedly taking out and replacing his false teeth. <laughs> For a decade or so, Marsh and Cope's mutual dislike primarily took the form of quiet sniping, but in 1877 it erupted into Grandos, Grandos, Grandois? Goodness, how do you pronounce that? Grandiose, maybe. I think that's right. But in 1877, it erupted into grandiose dimensions. In that year, a Colorado schoolteacher named Arthur Lakes found bones near Morrison while out hiking with a friend. Recognising the bones as coming from a gigantic saurian, Lakes thoughtfully dispatched some samples to both Marsh and Cope. A delighted Cope sent Lakes one hundred dollars for his trouble and asked him not to tell anyone of his discovery, especially Marsh. Confused, Lakes now asked Marsh to pass the bones on to Cope. Marsh did so, but it was an affront that he would never forget. 
It also masked the, masked, marked the start of a war between the two that became increasingly bitter, underhand, and often ridiculous. It sometimes stooped to one team's diggers throw, throwing rocks at the other teams. <laughs> oh dear. We, we think science is sort of uh, high science and gentlemen and uh, the truth, but they're throwing rocks at each other. <laughs> It sometimes stooped to one team's diggers throwing rocks at the other teams. Cope was caught at one point, prizing open crates that belonged to Marsh. They insulted each other in print and poured scorn on each other's results. Seldom, perhaps never, has science been driven forward more swiftly and successfully by animosity. Over the next several years, the two men between them increased the number of known dinosaur species in America from nine to almost 150. Nearly every dinosaur that the average person can name, Stegosaurus, Brontosaurus, Diplodocus, Triceratops, was found by one or the other of them. <laughs> and I'll just read the, 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 the note here, the footnote, because it's quite interesting. The notable exception being the Tyrannosaurus rex, which was found by Barnum Brown in 1902. Unfortunately, they worked in such reckless haste that they often failed to note that a new discovery was something already known. Between them, they managed to discover a species called Eunetheres anseps no fewer than 22 times. It took years to sort out some of the classification messes they made. Some are not sorted out yet. Of the two, Cope's scientific legacy was much more, much the more substantial. In a breathtakingly industrious career, he wrote some 1,400 learned papers and described almost 1,300 new species of fossil, of all types, not just dinosaurs, more than double Marsh's output in both cases. Cope might have done even more, but unfortunately he went into a rather precipitous descent in his later years. Having inherited a fortune in 1875, he invested unwisely in silver and lost everything. He ended up living in a single room in a Philadelphia boarding house, surrounded by books, papers and bones. Marsh, by contrast, finished his days in a splendid mansion in New Haven. Cope died in 1897, Marsh two years later. In his final years, Cope developed one other interesting obsession. It became his earnest wish to be declared the type... What? It became his earnest wish to be declared the type specimen for Homo sapiens, that is, to have his bones be the official set for the human race. Normally, the type specimen of a species is the first set of bones found, but since no first set of Homo sapiens bones existed, there was a vacancy which Cope desired to fill. It was an odd and vain wish, but no one could think of any grounds to oppose it. To that end, Cope willed his bones to the Wistar Institute, a learned society in Philadelphia endowed by the descendants of the seemingly inescapable Caspar Wistar. Unfortunately, after his bones were prepared and assembled, it was found that they showed signs of incipient syphilis, hardly a feature one would wish to preserve in the type specimen for one's own race. So Cope's petition and his bones were quietly shelved. There is still no type specimen for modern humans. As for the other players in this drama, Owen died in 1892, a few years before Cope or Marsh. Buckland ended up by losing his mind and finished his days a gibbering wreck in a lunatic asylum in Clapham, not far from where Mantle had suffered his crippling accident. Mantle's twisted spine remained on display at the Hunterian Museum for nearly a century before being mercifully obliterated by a German bomb in the Blitz. What remained of Mantle's collection after his death passed on to his children and much of it was taken to New Zealand by his son Walter, who emigrated there in 1840. Walter became a distinguished Kiwi, eventually attaining the office of Minister of Native Affairs. In 1865 he donated the prime specimens from his father's collection, including the famous Iguanodon tooth, to the Colonial Museum, now the Museum of New Zealand. In Wellington, where they have remained ever since, the Iguanodon tooth that started it all, arguably the most important tooth in paleontology, is no longer on display.
Of course, dinosaur hunting didn't end with the deaths of the great 19th century fossil hunters. Indeed, to a surprising extent, it had only just begun. In 1898, the year that fell between the deaths of Cope and Marsh, a trove greater by far than anything found before was discovered, noticed really, at a place called Bone Cabin Quarry, only a few miles from Marsh's prime hunting ground at Como Bluff, Wyoming. There, hundreds and hundreds of fossil bones were to be found weathering out of the hills. They were so numerous, in fact, that someone had built a cabin out of them, hence the name. In just the first two seasons, 100,000 pounds of ancient bones were excavated from the site, and tens of thousands of pounds more came in each of the half-dozen years that followed. The upshot is that, by the turn of the 20th century, paleontologists had literally tons of old bones to pick over. The problem was that they still didn't have any idea how old any of these bones were. Worse, the agreed ages for the Earth couldn't comfortably support the numbers of aeons and ages and epochs that the past obviously contained. If Earth were really only 20 million years old, or, or so, as the great Lord Kelvin insisted, then whole orders of ancient creatures must have come into being and gone out again practically in the same geological instant. It just made no sense. Other scientists beside Kelvin turned their minds to the problem and came up with results that only deepened the uncertainty. Samuel Horton, a respected geologist and Trinity at Trinity College in Dublin, announced an estimated age for the Earth of 23 or sorry, 2,300 million years, way beyond anything anybody else was suggesting. When this was drawn to his attention, he recalculated using the same data and put the figure at 153 million years. John Jolly, also of Trinity, decided to give Edmund Halley's ocean salts idea a whirl, but his method was based on so many faulty assumptions that he was hopelessly adrift. He calculated that the Earth was 89 million years old, an age that fitted neatly enough with Kelvin's assumptions, but unfortunately not with reality. Such was the confusion that, by the close of the 19th century, depending on which text you consulted, you could learn that the number of years that stood between us and the dawn of complex life in the Cambrian period was 3 million, 18 million, 600 million, 794 million, or 2.4 billion or some other number within that range. As late as 1910, one of the most respected estimates by the American George Becker put the Earth's age at perhaps as little as 55 million years. Just when matters seemed most intractably confused, along came another extra... Just when matters seemed most intractably confused, along came another extraordinary figure with a novel approach. He was a bluff and brilliant New Zealand farm boy named Ernest Rutherford, and he produced pretty well irrefutable evidence that the earth was at least many hundreds of millions of years old, probably rather more. Remarkably, his evidence was based on alchemy, natural, spontaneous, scientifically credible and wholly non-occult, but alchemy nonetheless. Newton, it turned out, had not been so wrong after all, and exactly how that became evident is, of course another story and so that's what's coming up in the next um chapter elemental matters and so it looks like we will discover the elements and the scientific justification for the age of planet earth again i find it highly fascinating and yeah i think anyone that doesn't you know is rather dull and i suppose they wouldn't be here at book club so uh leave them to themselves but i'm um, super interested and that'll be the end of this section and then the next is part three a new age dawns and einstein's universe and so we're racing through history with all these great figures great names and great discoveries and so yeah i hope you enjoyed that um learning about the fossils paleontology the discovery of the dinosaurs but still even to this point approaching the 19 or the 20th century people still don't know how old the earth is you know and how long life's been going and all this so we've still got a lot to discover but for now uh, i'll be back i don't know when i'll be back for another chapter of 
Bill Bryson's a short history of nearly everything, but if you're here listening to these words and me talking them and you are desperate and really interested in another chapter, you must make sure that you comment and say, another chapter please, another chapter please, and, and if, yeah, the more people that request another chapter, the more quickly it'll come, otherwise when I've got some time I'll do another chapter, and we still have a, a hell of a lot of the book to read, you can see this is what we've read here, and this is what we've got to read, so I don't think there's any rush, but if you guys are really enjoying it, you let me know, and I'll bring one sooner rather than later, so guys take care, and I'll see you soon. Bye now.